Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And this is the Industrial Design Podcast by us. It's true. I mean, it's one it's, one Industrial Design it's Podcast. It's D-I- us. D-I-S. Um, welcome. If this is your first time listening, we like to talk about design and our lives, and we're just freelancers in New York, so. Yeah. And if it's your first time watching. Right. We got it. We're trying to include a video element. Yes. Hopefully it'll work out. We'll see. Otherwise, we'll just cut this whole section out of the podcast. Um, I think we'll upload it to YouTube on, I guess, Minor Details YouTube? Yeah, we're going to... We'll figure it out. We're going to create a, a new account, yep. Minor Details. I think I'll upload some of the major details after the pods, okay. since we already have those recorded. Yeah, if you guys never tune into major details after the pod, it's hard to catch because it's just on the whim. It is it is pretty you elusive. Ne- you never know when it's going to come. It is the Mew 2 <laughs> of, uh, Our, uh, of after the... podcast live shows. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but how you been, James? I've been pretty good. We, we've been working together for the past, like, Three days. Yeah, I mean, we've been we've been shut into a sweat box. <laughs> Actually, it's more of an ice box. An ice box. Well, yeah. yeah so James and I've been uh, hanging out at my studio, working on some some consulting project, and the AC blows right into James, and then I'm over in the corner where there is no AC, but there's a lot of sunlight, so I'm sweating while James is freezing. Yeah, and we found that that's optimal for for creating. Uh, groundbreaking design work. A good, a good dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, tensions <laughs> tensions go high, but that's where the good designs I come. I feel like, Nick, you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> you, like, walk over there, and I hear you changing the AC, and I know you're just dropping it. Oh, man. But, but um, uh, speaking of your studio, you had somebody else in your studio last week, didn't you? Yeah, didn't yeah. Didn't you? I did. <laughs> Are you jealous, James? Maybe. Um, I didn't get to be your intern. <laughs> yeah, last week, I guess we can kind of roll into weekly updates. My This past week, I was in my studio working with Chris Ferentz, uh, who's only in high school. He's really passionate about design. He's going into his senior year of high school, and he, he messaged me you know, a couple months ago. And he's like, hey, Nick, you know, I really admire your work. I've been following you for a while. I'd be interested in just coming to your studio for a week and helping out you know, no, no strings attached. And he said, yeah, I'm already going to be in New York. Uh, I'm visiting my family and I don't really have much to do. So can I just help you out? Nice. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was, I, I hate the fact that like it can't compensate for interns or, or I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out the whole thing. I definitely bought you lunch or bought Chris lunch. Uh, so, (laughs) As he, as if he's like the only listener on the podcast. <laughs> I bought you lunch, Chris. <laughs> no, but I really, I really did appreciate Chris's work, and we worked on some cool stuff, and hopefully, well, you'll see the fruits of that labor. Mm. So that'll be exciting. You guys designed fruit, uh, like new fruit. Actually, we did tomatoes. Are those fruits or vegetables? Oh man, <laughs> innovation! I'm just kidding. Um, and by the way, it's pronounced chris reference okay okay (laughs) um but uh that's cool did he work a full nine to five oh i put him on like a more like a nine or 8 30 a.m to like 7 p.m schedule you know i i worked him pretty hard (laughs) got it i squeezed a nice like 10 hours out of him nice Mm -hmm. yeah here's your lunch you ungrateful little (laughs) i mean yeah i mean would you be happy if i bought you like a a nice like bologna sandwich that's what i bought if you're in high school I we had senior internships when I was in high school, and I'm pretty sure I didn't get paid. Yeah, I had a I in high school. I called them apprenticeships for whatever reason. It was definitely. Were you uh, were you uh, blacksmithing? N- I was painting. It was oh. like an appre- is an apprenticeship kind of like where in in return for knowledge you sweep the floors. I think that is... It's very... It's along the same it, lines. I think those... Yeah. If you if you trace it back to its Latin origins, apprenticeship means he who sweeps the floors. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm not going to double check you on that, but... Yeah. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Apprenticeships... I, I feel like we've lost something in, in the loss of apprenticeship. Because I, I, I kind of feel like, you know... What was the what was the point for some people going to college? It's like you could just go into apprenticeship 
and have that master apprentice relationship mm. with somebody. I mean, so many people learn a lot of their job on the job. That's true. And I mean, Chris Ferentz has learned a ton about industrial design. And he's in high school. He's in still. high school. That's in, that's crazy to me. Yeah. To think about. I know. Sometimes I feel like his tutor. Some I'm I'm like constantly messaging him about his projects. He's he's hungry for design. I know. So I'm I'm definitely excited to see what he does because yeah. when you have that much passion and you're in high school, there's a there's a long way ahead of yeah. You know, great great things to come and great failures to learn from. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I don't really think I have any updates. Okay. So I think we'll just go ahead to the design news. <laughs> design news. Yeah, tell me about it, James. You found something? Well, yeah, I um, I came across this article on CNET, and it's about, it was specifically about, uh, have you heard of the, the Microsoft Adaptive Controller? Okay, I saw it. Yeah, so basically it's, it's sort of this open source controller, I guess, and it's for people with limited mobility. Okay. Is it is it control like Xbox or computers? Xbox. Or, okay, Xbox. Xbox. So, um, so it's know, a gaming controller. Yeah, it's a gaming controller for those with limited mobility. So it has kind of these two pads and a big D-pad, but you can also plug things into the controller. Okay. So you can sort of like plug in like a, a big button, a big trigger. So for, you know, for people who can maybe only have the use of their head, they can like put a button right next to their head. They showed this in the Xbox video. There was a, there there was was a, a guy? guy that had a button right next to his head and he, he could hit that. Wait, so was he leaning over on the table and hitting the button or was no it, they propped it they up. mounted it they on mounted the... it on, i think on his on his wheelchair oh that's interesting um yeah it's it's pretty amazing okay but the article that came up on cnet for me was about the packaging itself um which they they took the whole ethos around the controller about being accessible to people with limited mobility and they did all this research and they they designed the packaging to um you know accommodate the same sort of like uh user needs okay so it was very accessible packaging as well yeah and you know what they used what they use you know what they use what do they use James? they use loops <laughs> you're a loop man there i'm loopy for loops they are the ultimate they are the ultimate ergonomic device the loop James, you get you you get on those like details, man, and you love them. You like those loops. You like this uh, one detail we're working on right now in our oh, freelance yeah. project. And... Yeah, yeah, I'll beat you over the head with it. Um, oh, we can't man. put any loops in that project, Nick. There's so. there's no loops in our freelance no. project, but but um, no, but the the cool thing about the loops is that they have them as sort of like how you break open the package in terms of like the ad- the adhesive. Okay, so kind of like the tape has a loop on it exactly and so you pull on the loop and it undoes the tape yes okay so so people with limited mobility i mean the loop is just it's something that you know if you don't have the full use of the the dexterity of your fingers or maybe you have you know you don't even have like a a full finger or you know set of fingers you can you can sort of hook into this area and even you know like you could think about other parts of your body that you could hook into this loop to get it to open right you know you could grab it with your mouth yeah you know there's there's all sorts of implications there with that loop toes toes yeah yeah keep going (laughs) keep going nick i I mean ear maybe maybe (laughs) i don't know um but uh i just thought it was a really awesome project and i mean microsoft doing this controller to begin with is just a really i think it's a really cool project it's something that like you know a big company like that it's it's cool to see when they when they do things that are a bit more, um, I don't know. It's it's a bit more experimental in for a sure, way, for sure. And and it's and it's catering to a more niche market, yeah. but a market that wants to game. I also think it's cool that they did this for you know people that have limited accessibility, but it also is a great experience for anyone. Right. I mean, I would love to pull on loops and have things like open yeah. up and have this like magical moment. Yeah. Well, did you see the um, Nintendo had the nin- did the Nintendo Labs? Oh, with the cardboard box. Yeah, thing? that is also a really cool project. I you'll have to refresh my memory. From what I remember, it was 
Nintendo had, you know, the new game console, the Nintendo Switch, and then they sold extra, I guess, DIY kits where it yeah. was like cardboard cutouts. Exactly. And so, like, you could cut out a robot and add in the Nintendo Switch controllers, and it would yep. do it would magically like turn into something. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it just basically used the controller as it used them for inputs. Cause it, it, you know, the controller itself takes all in all sorts of sensory information. Right. Right. So, you know, there was, and, and it was a separate thing that you would buy. It wasn't, it didn't come included with the, uh, the switch box, but you know, there's like a piano thing. And, okay. Like, but it's cardboard. It's all it's, cardboard. It's all cardboard, and, and you're building these cardboard things and using the controllers as as the inputs. Yeah, that was a cool project um, for sure. Really, really interesting. And it's yeah, it's just like cool. It's cool to see big companies taking risks on more exploratory for sure and experimental designs for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, I did. I did have another piece of. I did have a piece of design news. Okay, what's your design news? So. I, uh, you know my Muji pen hanger okay. um, from the MakerBot competition. Yes. I I kind of, you know, last week I, I kind of got this fire under my under my tuchus. Okay. And I was like, you know what? Why couldn't this be a real thing? Why couldn't Muji make this? Okay. And just to refresh everyone's memory, this, oh, this yes. Muji pen holder is, it attaches to ballpoint. Is it ballpoint? It attaches gel? to the Muji gel pens. They're gel pens. Yeah. And it's just a little hook that yeah. hooks onto a stand that you designed. Yes. So it first started with the hook um, and then came the stand. Okay. So, so it was the idea of like, if you have the hook, which I which I wanted for the fidget. Right. And it's a loop. It's a, it's a loop. Well, it's a hook. That's a hook. Okay. A loop is full. <laughs> almost, almost a loop. You know, get your terminology correct. Or you know you you should know this. Okay. These are minor details. Okay. <laughs> oh man. Um. So yeah, it was a hook, and um. So if you have a hook, like you should hook it onto something. And I found out actually in research that that hooking a gel pen or not hooking, but but putting a gel pen face down is actually better for the pen. I always put all my pens face down. Actually, they're actually all lying on their side like they're sleeping. But if I had a... Do you tuck, do you tuck in your Monamis at night? I tuck in all my little Monamis. Shh. You did such a great job today. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I always put my pants face down when I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... So um, wait, are you taking that research into account? Yes. I, well, I mean, that is essentially what the hanger does right now, is oh. it puts them face down. Okay. And there were all sorts of... There were all sorts of other benefits. Like, you know, if you have them like that... The uh, the the ink almost looks like a status bar. You know, you can kind of see it as like, oh, yeah. this pen is more full. This yeah. pen is less full. I actually had this idea of like a teeter totter because I was wondering if less ink in the pen, no, there's if no it way. would, if it would, I don't it's, know, Nick. It's such a nominal amount that I, I don't know, <laughs> Nick. I don't know. Um, that's called science. Uh, but um, we're not scientists. <laughs> But uh, it, I also call it. I also call the the Muji pen ha- hanger a desktop wind chime because uh, it kind of looks like that. It but does. it doesn't. It doesn't sound like it. No. It just sounds like a bunch of plastic. Wait, clinking. wait. Yeah. So, so you have an update on your Muji pen hanger? Yes, yes, yes. You got some feedback on it? Yes. I I decided in a moment where I was like, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good today. How about I ask for feedback on a design that I like, and. I first put up a poll of if Muji designed this or if Muji produced this, would you buy it? And I think it ended up at 54% of, of the people who answered the survey said they would buy it. I, I said no. I know you did. And then you messaged and it was, <laughs> and it was like betrayal. You messaged me specifically and you're like, Nick, why would you say no? Why? And I was like, well, it's, I don't use Muji pens. I'm not, <laughs> I mean, it's like, why would I buy a, a truck? I don't know. I wouldn't use it. I don't need a truck. I don't know because you support your friends' <laughs> hopes and dreams. Okay, if it was in support of you, then yes, I, yeah, I would there purchase you go. it. Thank you very much. Um, although I've yet to buy a Ben Mirror, but it's okay James. tonight. Tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, but then I asked, you know, if you could, what would you change about it? Because I was curious, like, if people were saying no, why? Well, why? What do they say? And I got some I got some interesting feedback and and um, a lot of it was around the hook itself 
and people feeling like the hook was like too big or not the right shape or not really like the hook itself was not really Muji. Mm, um, interesting. You know, and and which like surprised me because I felt like, you know, that was the core of the idea was the fidget. Right. But the I think people, when they see it, they think the core of the project is the hanging. And uh, yes, so a lot I would of, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do call it the Muji pen hanger. Right. So um, there were there were a lot of suggestions for magnets, which I thought was interesting. Everyone loves magnets. Yeah. Jay. But oh. just imagine if that ring on top of the hanger was actually metal and there was a little magnet in each pen and you just. Uh, yeah. I, I Can agree. you imagine how magical that would be? Listen, I'm and, not, I'm not discounting the, the fact that it wouldn't thing. be magical. But. Here's the thing, Nick. There are stockpiles of magnets. In your basement? Yes. <laughs> um, it's a very dangerous place to visit, especially yeah. if you have anything metal on you. Right, you got to take all your electronics out before yeah. you visit. But um, but no, I mean, I like. I think it's an interesting idea, and I think it actually is probably more Muji. To like to have just magnets. to just have these pens hanging off of this ring, and it sort of be like, how is that even happening? Yeah, I think there's, I think, I think I can see some sort of design there. I I don't know. I I agree with some of the feedback you got, mm-hmm. um, and maybe not all the feedback was. What right. was your feedback? Because you didn't give me any feedback. <laughs> What's your feedback? My feedback is is that it's not made for my Monami, oh. my Monami one five three stick. But then I, of course, put up a uh, another poll that said, like, you know, I asked about the, the the hook and being able to fidget. And I said, you know, how important is this part of it to you? And again, it was like a 54, oh, really? 56% I definitely, split. I definitely put on that that was important. Like yeah. I, the fidget aspect made it the cool, that, that that's what made it the product. Yeah. But another thing that was brought up was pen balance. Which I thought was interesting. Oh, like having it on the center? Like the like, fidget part in the center? Yeah, or just that having it on the end would cause an imbalance of the pen. And people are very particular about pen weights and especially designers. That's true. You know? That's so true. I totally understood it. There was, But there was one piece of criticism that I got a couple times. What was that? That I... I this, is a, this is a topic. Okay. This here is a topic. And a lot of people saying... This problem has already been solved. Oh, what, what do you so mean this problem's already been solved? The pen organization problem. Oh, like organizing your pens has yes. already been... A th- like, you don't have to redesign You it. don't have to redesign... Because there's already pen organizers. The cup. You don't have to redesign the, uh, the, the desk tray. I mean, this is like... This is... Ah, this irks me because there's a lot of people out there that will be like, why are you designing x design when there's already you know a gazillion products out there that do the same thing yeah it was like why get up and do anything <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah i mean that's a yeah that's an interesting thing i like does does there need to be a problem to create a new solution i don't know can can you hand me your pens for a second yeah so so let me ask you something is this pleasant? Is James. this okay, James? Is, is this pleasant? Okay, for those for those of you listening, okay, gosh, James is uh, clinking my my pens against his wine glass. Yeah, I mean that is essentially what happens when you drop pens into a cup. Oh, you get that clink, mm. and nobody. That was a good. That was a good point. Nobody is saying, "Hey, I want that clink in my life." They're also, if they are, they're some sort of sadomasochists. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think like, I, I don't know. It's like we can go down a rabbit hole of what is worth designing. Um, I mean, I've gotten this, this comment a couple times on my work, uh, you know, especially when I think about my glassware project that I've been recently working on and people are, a few of the comments were like, why are you adding in this extra functionality of this silicone base that also works as a, a a lid and why can't you just make normal glasses like why can't and and then that even goes farther like if i'm making normal glasses why why even make normal glasses when there's already plenty of glasses out there right it's a it's a 
it's almost the industrial design's existential crisis. Because I remember in school, people would talk about how, you know, we're, our profession is going out into the world and creating new things. Yeah. But, you know, does the world need another chair? Mm-hmm. And it's it's tough. It's a tough it's a tough question to answer. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, our profession's built on the fact that yes, the world does need another chair. But I don't think the world needs another chair. I think the world just needs a better chair. Right. But better is subjective. It is, and that's where the rub comes in. Yeah. Because I mean, a chair when you're furnishing your home is a statement about who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I look around in the world and I look at some of the more like mundane objects, I I think to myself, I would I don't I don't like this. I want it to be I want it to be a bit different. Yeah. You know? And to that, represent you. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want it to be just some boring old thing. And I think that if you design a good a good product or you have a good insight about something, it will resonate with with more people than just yourself. Right. Um, and obviously, I mean, you know, it, should I should I say it was a defeat that that only 53% of the people who answered the polls said that they would buy it? I mean, that's a that's a market. That's 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 like, still people. That is still people. Still people. Yeah, and I mean, I, not everyone's going to buy like, I don't know, my glassware set. I mean, Yeah. It's not for everyone. And, um, you know, I, the other thing is like, they're coming up with all sorts of alternatives to plastic, to the current plastic. Oh, was plastic a thing? I mean, plastic. Was there like a comment that was like, Hey, don't make another plastic thing because it's polluting the world. Right. Oh, we did. We haven't talked about sustainability, but that's a a topic. It's a topic that's going to come up one day. It's a tough topic. Yeah, Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I remember, seeing somebody else get trolled it was reed yeah what he did what was it was was, uh it was over the watering can thing okay and and somebody trolled him saying he was wasting plastic how by 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 even just printing out his uh watering cans what you mean like making a prototype yeah prototype wait so he he, you're saying that someone like chastised reed schlegel for printing out i don't know like a kilogram of plastic yeah i mean it was it was crimes against the royalty and he was publicly (laughs) no i i mean here's but here's the thing so he yeah he chastised him i went and looked at his profile this guy who was who was railing against and he was dumping oil barrels into the (laughs) ocean (laughs) his uh yeah his uh his his uh handle was oil baron barry and uh and yeah he was like He's like, got to dump out another barrel today, another day, another barrel. Um, but no, what what he did professionally was design furniture. And to me, it's like, how are you sitting on this high horse designing furniture? Like, you could go down the rabbit hole and be like, yeah, do we need another sofa? Do we need another right. chair? Right. Like, there's there's all sorts of, you know, it's just like a never-ending hole. And like... What you come out with is, unless you are solving for some sort of infectious disease, or you're solving world hunger, world poverty, uh, or um, eliminating global warming altogether, uh, you might as well not be an industrial designer. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you even go far enough, it's like you should not have kids or yeah. I mean, we could even go farther than that. I mean, I, you know, this is, and this is a question that I have really is, do we even really have the tools, you know, sort of like a calculator or anything that, that we can really assess, like, if I did this, this is the impact that it would create on humans or the environment or whatever, like, do we really have good metrics for those? Yeah, and there's not like a a way to calculate. Well, they do have carbon footprints, right? They obviously calculate carbon carbon footprints of all kinds of products. Uh, I think you know the the you know mass consumer doesn't understand the fact that there are so much energy already put into a product to make mm-hmm. it to the store. Right. Yeah, you can buy some sort of vegan, gluten free like 
hippie, you know, <laughs> save the environment <laughs> sort of product. But guess what? It still had to be manufactured somewhere right. and shipped to that place. And there's still energy put in to that actual experience before you right. can buy the product. And and to add another existential <laughs> level. Oh, man. We, we just went. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we went deep. Yeah, we're going deep on this. At, a, at another existential level, I feel like life <laughs> life is kind of tough. Like life is is not, you know, it's not always great. Like it for a lot of people, it's like I, you know, they're looking for any sort of pleasure that they can get for out sure. of the day to for remove sure. them of the the pressures of life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, my whole thought behind the Muji pen hanger is we have a situation, we have an interaction that's not really that delightful. Right. What if it was delightful? Yeah, I think, you know, you and I both agree on this point. It's like, just because you design a new product or a new thing that doesn't necessarily solve a new problem, you know, maybe you're doing a pen hanger or some glasses like like I am, it still is an opportunity to add in some sort of delight or new interaction into your daily life like just because it doesn't solve a problem doesn't mean that it can't make someone's day just a slightly slightly bit better right you know just make them happy yeah and 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 another thing i remember watching this video that was about how the piano roll you remember you remember player pianos like they were these it was an old old thing that they would put these rolls into these pianos and the piano would play itself you know they have like I the rolls don't. have like cutouts in them oh okay kind of and, like a big music box of yeah sort. okay and so the player the the piano would play itself well this video linked the player piano to the i think the computer chip like there was oh because it was similar in in the way that you had punch cards computer yeah exactly because in the old computers, you had to enter the punch card or whatever, yeah. right? Hmm. So I I think the other thing is, is that, like, it's really hard to figure out, like, what the things that we're doing now, how they will impact the future. But perhaps some weird thing that we concoct, you know, could be an inspiration for something, f- like, way out in the future. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I always... Whenever I, whenever someone says the comment of like you aren't solving a new problem or like why are you doing this this doesn't solve anything, I always think about you know like the the inventors of the past, mm-hmm. like how they were criticized for like hey, what are you doing Henry Ford you're making a motorized car I have a horse right I only all I gotta feed my horse is carrots and he can <laughs> he can he can take me to the store I don't need this car what right you, you know and, and people I, would like are there people are always resistant to change you know yeah. And I think we're also on the verge of like major breakthroughs when it comes to material and the reuse of material. Mm. Uh, I know I I heard in an interview, the guy who's like the lead of, I think it's called the Ocean Cleanup Project. He's like a, uh, I think he's Dutch. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about they're going to take, you know, they're, they have this plan to clean up the ocean, pla- you know, from, from all the waste and plastic right. that's gathered. Right. Also, how remarkable is it that the world is kind of, it, it's filtering all the trash into one spot, kind of. Right. There's the big, what is it called? The big the Pacific the ocean. Pacific uh, garbage patch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Garbage patch kids. You remember those games <laughs> growing up? Um, but... Um, but yeah, so he was talking about, you know, taking those those pieces of plastic out of the ocean and then being able to reuse them. Like he, you know, he sees there like no reason why we couldn't reuse plastic. Right. And, you know, it so I think um I think hold tight everybody. Yeah. You know, I I think I think we're going to be okay. Yeah, don't don't yeah, I think especially when you're a student. I remember when I was in school, you know, there's a lot of uh, of my fellow students were always concerned about the fact that like, oh, am I just going to go get a job where I have to make more plastic crap? Mm. And uh, yeah, I think that is the answer. <laughs> the answer is yes. If you're in school, like that's probably what you're going to do. But um, but doesn't mean you can't make an impact. Like what? Like here's a here's an interesting story, James. Mm. Um, I think you just have to make the best 
of every situation you're in. Right. That's really what it comes down to. You know, when I worked on pet products, I remember one of the projects I worked on was redesigning these little cat toy dice. Mm. Essentially, uh, there's the, there's products out there, and you can buy them, but someone was inspired by, you know those milk tabs? You can kind of pull off the top of a gallon of milk. Right. Well, cats love those. They'll play with it. They'll just bat it around. It's just like some plastic like thing, plastic yeah. piece that cats like. And they've designed a whole line of products around it. And I was tasked with like redesigning a, a, a plastic tab for a cat, oh, which n- which <laughs> essentially is like, hey, Nick, can you design plastic trash for us? <laughs> you know, like that's that's what they're saying. But I took that opportunity to be like, yeah, you know, just because this this plastic tab is like some sort of tchotchke thing doesn't mean I can't implement great design into it. So I designed this plastic kind of loop that went around a sphere. So not only did it, it was shaped like a ball, so it added that extra functionality that, you know, it could roll around the floor, but it used a lot less plastic because it was like this continuous loop. And you could also intermingle them into one one toy and mm. you could add treats into it. It was... You know, it was like pushing the boundaries of what you could do with the material you're given. And, yeah. And in, in in that case, you know, maybe someone can use those plastic tabs a little bit longer because they have extra functionality. To yeah. Them. And I feel like a lot of, I do feel like a lot of these arguments uh, about solve an actual problem are coming from young idealistic designers. Mm. And I don't think you should let go of that idealism, but you know... Unfortunately, right out of school, you can't really get the world changing job. Right. Yeah. Like, especially if you're not like at the top of your class or whatever. Right. Like, you know, sometimes you like, I, you know, I had to go, I, I went, I didn't have to go, but I, but I, I went and designed kitchenwares. Right. And the thing that, that I realized when I was there was there were so many times that we were proposing new projects and, like I would say only maybe 5% of the things that we actually proposed got produced. Mm. So you should be thankful for that. Like, right. You should be thankful that not every idea that an industrial designer has ever had gets produced. Right. You know? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's bad to be thinking about these things, to be thinking about what kind of impact will this have you know, uh, is the way that this is manufactured, like, could it be disassembled and, right. and recycled? And I don't think it's bad to have these thoughts, but I think when you're young, like, the most important thing is get a job. Yeah, there's and... there's definitely some romanticism about uh, design when you're in school and right after you graduate, it's like, oh, I have this new job that I can impact all the consumer products of the entire world. Like, this is an enormous power, but... You know, the bottom line is, is you have to start somewhere. Like, you don't have that power when you graduate. You have to earn it. You have to work your way up the ladder. Yeah. Um, unless you're some sort of prodigy, then maybe yeah, I mean, can surpass that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I just think, um, I don't know. I, I think that's pretty much all the thoughts that I have on, yeah. on that. I think that there's nothing wrong with things that make people a little bit happier yeah. in their existence. And, and even... Even to that, James, I think it's great because you never know what what the day of a person is going to be like. Maybe they're just really not happy that day, and just that one interaction of spinning that pen on their finger just just brightens their day just that yeah. little bit to make it better. And I feel like there's all sorts of research that shows like some people need to fidget to think, and maybe just maybe that person is working on some world changing <laughs> exactly exactly thing and they're like exactly. oh oh i've got it and, yeah. and then the pen like flies off their finger right and into somebody's eye you, no. and then that person oh, has no. to go to the hospital oh, no, and get no, it no, removed no, no, and, no, no. and you were you were ahead but then we, we started going down no. <laughs> you were but uh but yeah i don't i don't know you just never know and and i think that like as long as I, I, I feel invigorated by these types of projects. And so these are the types of projects that I'm going to pursue. Yeah. You yeah, know, for sure. So anyway, uh, I think now's the, now's about a, the best time to get into the questions. We should answer some portion. questions before we start, uh, going on about our existential crisis of yeah. design. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, this is from Derek. Okay. Um, and uh, Derek you, Elliott. Derek Elliott. You might know from uh, uh, our collaboration with the uh, the helicopter. The f- yeah. The first flight of the helicopter. He's a wizard at animating. He's oh man, beautiful, beautiful rendering work, beautiful animating right. work. He's also an, a trained industrial designer. Okay. He's he's got some really nice projects. So, uh, anyway, he asks for someone. Uh, to make an impact in a creative field, they often need to specialize. In this world where industrial designers are deemed jacks of all trades and masters of none, what creates an excellent industrial designer? Of all the skills an industrial designer may possess, what do you see as some interesting, valuable combinations? Huh. Okay, so Derek's essentially asking, like, industrial designers are supposed to be able to kind of culminate all their skills into what like i don't know he says masters of none are we not masters of design though i think the the thing about design is that it takes a a lot of of other things yeah a bunch of other things Hmm. like it's like you're you're like a a light artist you're a light scientist you're a light uh anthropologist you're right you know you're you're sort of all of these things a light sculptor you know yeah, I guess that makes sense, huh? Yeah, we're we're basically um, uh, the diet of careers. We're we're. <laughs> and so, so what skills does industrial designer need to possess to bring something interesting to the table? Yeah, I I don't know. I think maybe you do have to. I, here's what I would say. Okay, I, I would say figure out what part of design you're passionate about. Whether that's sketching, whether that's like making or executing maybe your idea person maybe your research person person mm-hmm. and really focus on that right and build that as your core value as an id yeah uh, that makes sense because because when i think about it um especially you think about consulting studios and things like that where you know they'll, they might might have a team of industrial designers where one person is mainly on the research and one person's mainly on the conceptual side yeah and one person mainly mainly on the cad side um, and maybe that maybe that's how it works maybe that's not how it works but i think when you have that strong i guess uh, element to your skill set i think that can make you attractive to employers right yeah i mean i kind of think about like the t shape People talk about the T, T T-shaped designer, where, you know, the top of the T is like a broad skill set of things you do. Mm. And the the long part of the T is that one core skill that you have, whether that's sketching or, you know, 3D modeling or whatever it is. Yeah. And what about the three dots above the T? What? Three dots above the T? Yeah, those are silent. What kind of what kind of language are you reading, James? I don't I don't know what you're reading, Nick, but I read all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, what do, you, I don't, what do you think, James? Well, I mean, I think that um, I think that there there is a need with industrial designers. I feel like visualization is is a uh, is a big thing. Being able to communicate your ideas. I think that's kind of like a core skill for sure. Yeah. Like if you don't have that, like, what do you do? Yeah, I'm not sure, but but I think. I mean, is it visualization or is it just communication? Like, I I think of designers as people who are able to consolidate a bunch of information into a palatable form, Mm. you know? So, uh, I mean, that's often what we have to do is we have to take in all this information about materials and about usability and about, um, you know, whatever. We have to take in all of these all of these disparate pieces right. of information and consolidate them into a form and like synthesize it right synthesize it huh i yeah i mean maybe it's maybe the answer to derek's question is that yes we are the jack of all trades in the sense that we take all these things but we're not masters of none we're just synthesizers of these many things. <laughs> so, yeah there you go synthesis we're synthesizers yeah i, lo- I like that yeah yeah <laughs> We are teenage engineering synthesizers. Mm. Yeah, great company. Oh man, the best. But uh, but yeah, I um I think I think as long as you can uh, can communicate that synth that synthesizing, because like a graphic designer is definitely you know uh, like 
measured on their ability to take a lot of information and make it understandable. Right. You know, so I think that um, if you can communicate your idea, your synthesis of, of, of all these things to somebody and convince them of that, I think that's a very powerful skill. Right. And whether that comes through sketching visualization or modeling visualization or, you know, uh, or even just research. Um, I For think, sure. You know, all of that just has to be understandable. It's a lot about communication, synthesis and communication. Okay. Yeah, I like that answer. That's good. That's much better than my answer, James. Thank the, you. The tea, the tea, the tea <laughs> answer is a horrible answer. It's just so so we're done. All right. I don't like tea. I prefer coffee. <laughs> I'm a coffee guy too. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for sending that in, Derek. Uh, we also had another question from Dan uh, Shapiro, and he's actually an industrial design intern at Bose right now. And he asks, this is kind of interesting. He says, as freelance designers, um, essentially what he's asking is like, since you're alone, how do you validate the decisions that you're making are fully considered and that the design you've come up with is the right solution for the product and the company it's for? You know, essentially Dan's saying like, when you're sitting at home like freelancing or if you're working with a bunch of people that aren't designers, how are these how do you know that you're doing the correct design? That is a conundrum. Yeah. Because, you know, there, there's oftentimes, you know, I have been a freelancer in a role where I'm the only designer there. Or, right. yeah, I'm the only one specializing, specializing in industrial design. Um, and I think in that case, it just comes down to at the end of the day, do you feel satisfied in in the results and in the process? Or do you feel like you need to do more? I, I think, yeah, there's a good bit of intuition involved. I remember, you know, you said you've been the only designer in situations. I've certainly been the only designer in situations. Um, when I first started at the pet company, I was like, I was hired as the first industrial designer there. Like, mm-hmm. There was no industrial design team. There was me and the VP of design, my boss. Yeah. And which was crazy awesome because I could do whatever I wanted, but right. also crazy scary because I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a lot of responsibility in that. And how do you know when the design is right? I think it takes time. I mean, obviously, I've designed a lot of products, and I think that some of the products weren't great. And I look back at them, and I'm like, yeah, I didn't do a great job. And sometimes it was influenced by marketing or sales or whatever right. type of industry you're in. I mean, sometimes other factors influence the design and kind of guide that design. And it, it kind of helps to have those restraints sometimes. Yeah. But I, I do think, I mean, at, in this particular experience that I'm in right now where, um, you know, the, com- the, the company that I'm contracting for brought Nick in. You know, I, I I put in a word for Nick. They were talking about bringing in other industrial designers. And I have to say, it was incredibly helpful to bring in another designer, a fresh set of eyes. We're kind of like hamsters. You know when you get one hamster, they're really lonely? So you have to get two? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's how designers are. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think it's been very valuable to have another designer. So if you have the option to bring in another designer, even for a day to review the work that you've done to just like, you know, if you can convince your client, like, Hey, I would love to like bring in somebody. I value their opinion. Right. Like, can I bring them in for the day and, and get their feedback? That is a good piece of advice for sure. Um, I think that can be very helpful because, uh, you know, like I feel like I like Nick, when he came in, brought these these f- this fresh set of ideas right. and, and a fresh perspective because you've been and, looking at it up close for yes. so long and then when someone else comes in they're like oh hey what are you doing why don't you just do this <laughs> then it's like whoa whoa i didn't even think about that yeah i love when that happens yeah because because i had at that point i had generated so many concepts and gotten to a point where i was like i'm i'm satisfied with this but then you know, I, I think it was a process of me coming from back here and getting so close to the board. Right. And then Nick came in and shattered the board. And then I realized that it was this far away. 
And, uh, you know, I think that as your career goes on, you might develop a better sense of intuition about these things. But I don't I don't think it's ever a bad idea to bring in another designer, a fresh set of eyes. Yeah. Yeah. To get some feedback. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's a great question. Dan. I appreciate you sending that in. Yeah. Um, Oh, we have one more question. Yes. Uh, Jeremiah asks. Uh, ideas come to you both pretty frequently, it seems. And with all the personal projects that you do, how do you prioritize them and then stick to them instead of starting on another idea uh, that you come to? Oh, that's a good one. This is... Also, Jeremiah, you're assuming that ideas come to us frequently, it seems. <laughs> James, do ideas come to you a lot? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean... Um... I don't know. I th- I guess semi regularly. There's a lot of like ideas that come to me, but they're not good ideas. <laughs> oh yeah. What well, was it like on a daily basis or? Yeah, I'm always I'm always like sketching up things, but they're never good. What was an idea that came to you that you were like, no, mm. not gonna do it? Is there any that come to mind? Oh, man, no, because I usually block them out of my memory. <laughs> You're like you're like ashamed that yeah. you thought of them in the um, first place. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, this is a really good question because I often find myself always wanting to start a project and uh, and not really wanting to finish projects unless I unless I have a deadline. This is the great the great dilemma of every designer. Yeah. Every person, honestly. Right. How many people you know started remodeling their kitchen and then never finished? Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the thing that I would always do, I played a lot of Diablo 2 back okay. in the day. Which is a video game. Yeah, Blizzard. Mom. And I I always used to, I would start new characters instead of like, you know, really developing my one character. Okay, I would so, you, al- so you had a lot of like noob characters and oh, not yeah. one powerful character. Yes. Mm, such a shame. I know. But eventually, I you know I stuck with I stuck with a couple like okay. I had like a, a couple that I would a crew yeah a crew nice nice I accrued a crew, but uh, but yeah I think it's um I don't know I I think it is it is difficult sometimes if you don't have some sort of deadline to say like like you kind of have to create an artificial one and say I'm gonna be done like. I'm going to be done with this at the end of the week and then I'm never going to touch it again. Right. I, yeah, there, this is kind of like touching on the fact of like, how do you motivate yourself to do personal projects? Right. And how do you know that it's done? Right. Well, <laughs> that's a tough one. How do you know it's finished? I mean, that's, that could be a whole like topic, but I think for me, personal projects, sometimes it helps to tell someone else about it. Like right. if you keep it to yourself and you're like, Oh, I'm working on this like secret little thing. I'm not gonna tell anyone about it. Guess what? That thing's never getting done. Yeah. <laughs> because you're just you're working on it and you're gonna work on it forever and ever. If you tell someone about it, they're gonna keep you accountable. I mean, hopefully. If yeah. You have, if you have good friends. They're gonna be like, Nick, why haven't you finished that almost object t shirt? Yes. Now if you're married, you always have somebody tell to tell that you're working on something. <laughs> does does Allison ever tell you that you need to finish your project, James? No, but she'll tell me if if something is cool or if it's not cool. All right. I think Allison should start being like, hey, James, you need to finish this by Friday at noon if you don't turn it into me. <laughs> I mean, I was working late the other night and she was not she was not too happy, I don't think. No. That, you know, it's like the bedtime is bedtime. The bedtime is bedtime. So, so uh, you know, I, I think I do need to create some sort of artificial deadlines about when to get things done. But we had, we had an email a while ago about from somebody that, um, that they were saying that they didn't think that they had gone to a very good design school and they were trying to get motivated to do side projects, but they could never finish their side projects or they would just second guess themselves. Yeah. This is definitely a very common thing. Yeah. I mean, we do it. I, I've done it multiple times. Yeah. And, and according to some of the commenters on my Mucha pen hanger, I should have really, reconsidered what i did and not even done it in the first place but uh um i think like you know it's sort of like a a a muscle that you have to work out and and um but i think that if you're getting started on side projects i think it's a really good idea to just say like you know what this saturday i am starting and finishing a project yeah make it totally manageable you know, make it something like that you can do. Yeah, in I a mean, day. 
I mean, Reed and I did the watering can project and that was like, we would sit down and we would brainstorm and then oftentimes I would go home and like model it. Right. And there was no, there was no second guessing. It was like, Hey, you brainstormed. This is what it is. Like, this is is the process. This is what you guys set up from the beginning. Yeah. And that sort of, that sort of uh, routine will snowball Mm -hmm. into something bigger. I mean, this kind of tumbles into my whole Instagram like philosophy. It was like, do something every single day that you're proud of, you know, do just start small with daily things that you can accomplish. Right. And then you can build up from there. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know who, I'm sure there's a quote somewhere, but I, I feel like 95% of the, the work is finishing a project. Right. And 5% is actually starting the project. Yeah. I think somebody was telling me recently, there's, there's some sort of thing, there's some sort of quote in programming that's like when you've gotten 80% of the work done, you have to do 80% of the work to get twenty, <laughs> the last 20% finished. It's so true. It's so true. You know, because, cause, yeah, just like just getting a presentation together is a huge chunk of time. Right. It always takes twice as long as you think it will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, that's really, I mean, that's the synthesis part, right? Like that is, that's the, that is that final synthesis of, this is how I arrived at my solution. And like, you know, you don't want it to, you don't want it to be belabored. Like you don't want, you don't want too much explanation. You want it to be succinct enough that it resonates. Um, yeah. You know, like how you do your little cartoons at mm. the beginning of your project. Right, right, right. You know, something, something where it's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, exactly. Here's, here's something I've been thinking about. Like, have you ever started a project had had kind of built it out to almost a finished thing like you had a final concept and then shelved it mm. and just let it sit right and, and marinate right until later date and then you came back to it and, and either either two, one of two things either you were like this is still a great thing and i'm gonna mm. finish it or th- this is still actually this is not a great thing anymore right and i'm gonna chuck it right well, I guess... Because that is a strategy that I've actually heard of before where people right. will come up with ideas and maybe they start start a project and then they pin it up on the wall and they just wait. They right. just let it marinate and, you know, six months later, is it still a good project to finish? Right. I, um... Yeah, I guess, like, I guess the thing that, that it comes to mind is um, the last helicopter that I did, which is the helicopter that Derek has been animating okay um which uh is it the one with the propellers underneath the, the... the yeah it's sort of like it has the peller it's like it's sort of like an egg shaped mm-hmm. like in yeah. the center of the body yeah, yeah and the propellers are in sort of this um uh, the feet yeah they're in the feet that helicopter i did a number of versions of yeah. that i was never happy with was the final version you're happy with or no yes i'm very happy with the final version okay um and are you not happy with it, Nick? I think it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, it was just like this constant thing because I, I, I was trying to figure out how, how the feet, how the feet were, were going to work and then how the back, because, because, you know, with a helicopter, it's always about the carriage, the propeller, um, the propeller and then the back rotor. Yeah, rotor. Yeah. So thank you for the terminology. I'm pretty uh, sure we messed that all up. But that's okay. No, but uh, but I was trying to figure out like how does it connect? Does the rotor come off of the back leg? Oh, like how? Like right, right. it took me a very long time to figure out how to compose this helicopter. Right. Um, whereas all the other ones, I was sort of in this routine of just like doing them, just like just do another one, just do another one, and like kind of release them and and be like that's what it is, and 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 there it is. Yeah. But that one. That one took a while to marinate, and then one day I just like figured it out. Right, and uh, I'm glad that I waited. I'm like I'm glad that I didn't release the ones that I had done previously, and I'm glad that I waited. Like, and and I do feel very strongly about that last one. Yeah, no, that's good. That's um, a, that's definitely a good insight because it's all about. I feel like there's two kind of strategies. One strategy is just getting it out there, doing it, just finishing it, like just get it done and the other strategy is like once it's done or maybe before it's finished just 
set it aside, let it marinate. Yeah. You can always redo it. I mean, yeah. you know, technically design's never finished. Like, right. They say that. It's just like design is never going to be finished. Just right. the client needs it now. So. Right. What about you? Have you done that with any side projects? Like let it marinate? Yeah. Um, I've let my, my shirt project marinate a little bit that I've never finished yet. We've <laughs> mentioned it multiple times, but, um, yeah, I'm doing a t-shirt for almost object just to kind of, uh, make more awareness of the brand and stuff. And I've let it marinate. And I think I've come up with a, another little element that really will help it out. So mm. sometimes marination, marination, is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> We're about to make yeah, it a I thing. I think so. I think so. Is it marinate good, in its own juices? Is a good uh is a good strategy. Yeah. I think so. I, I I think um I think it was actually I love to talk about Paul Rand. But I think one of his things was like when somebody gives him a project, uh like would give him a project, he would get the proposal, he would think about it, and then he wouldn't touch it for a week. Oh. Like I, I think that that I I believe that that's something that he would do. There is definitely something with your subconscious that kind of just choose on the idea right it's in the back of your mind it's when you're sleeping it's yeah. when you're not thinking yeah but but uh he was also getting paid like a million dollars for a logo so he could uh <laughs> he could do that he could do that oh man all right thanks jeremiah for sending that in that was that was a great question thank yeah. you everyone um if you have a question feel free to send it into meyer details podcast at gmail.com yes and um, uh and when this when this podcast release, I mean, there, there, it'll obviously be on Apple Podcasts. So, so subscribe, right? On on Apple Podcasts, Rate, Google Play, comment. Um, but Google Play, this uh, will, podcast will ideally also be on YouTube. So please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yes, which should just be probably minor details. I mean, we could use the Gmail minor details podcast because. Yeah. Google owns YouTube. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll link to it. MyDetailsPodcast.com. We'll figure it all out. Yeah. We'll let you know. Um, also, I've been meaning to shout out our intro and outro by the awesome Kiyoshi the Kid. Oh, yeah. Check him out on SoundCloud. Love it. Um, Sometimes I'll just put it on and dance. <laughs> just dance. Feverishly. Oh, man. All right. James is itching to dance right now. So Yeah, I know. And I'm also itching to turn on that air conditioning. It's getting kind of hot in here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, We'll see you next time. Yeah. I'm James Connors, a.k.a. I Draw on Receipts. And I'm at Nick P. Baker. Peace out. Later.